Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Exodus chapter 20. As we are walking through the Ten Commandments, I believe this is um, sermon. This is we're on commandment number five. I believe this is um, sermon number six. So hear now God's word. This is Exodus twenty verse twelve. It says, "Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you." It's God's word for us this morning. Let's go to God now and ask for Him to bless it. O oh Lord. We receive your word. What you say, we believe. God, give us humility in the room. Give us eyes to see your word. And God, help us stand upon it as a church and as individuals. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I was going to tackle this commandment um, like all the rest. One, one commandment, one sermon. Right? That's what we've been doing besides the intro, but... Um, two things gave me pause um, as I was, I was studying, preparing this week. Number one, the kids aren't in the room today. So if I waited a week, they would be here with us for fifth Sunday family worship. And I really wanted them to hear God's word about the fifth commandment. And all the parents said, amen. Second, I realized that there were a lot of presuppositions behind the fifth commandment that are no longer presuppositions today. In other words, the fifth commandment assumes things that people have assumed for thousands of years, but that we don't assume in 2024. So I thought before we actually got to the fifth commandment, we needed to solidify as as a church our biblical worldview on these matters. And specifically, I mean those three words in the fifth commandment, father and mother. Those three words, father and mother. Those are controversial words today. And did you ever think that you would be in a culture where those three words, father and mother, would be controversial? A lot of my uh, dead heroes didn't have to deal with this. Charles Spurgeon didn't have to deal with this. But if you listen to the news, if you watch a political debate, if you scroll through social media, you will run into those three words. You will run into the issues that we're talking about in our sermon today. And I believe my job as a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's to equip you to view things in a biblical way. As, as we've said before, over and over again, at this church, we value truth because the Scripture is our standard and solution. So my, my desire is to equip you with God's Word. And I believe that we see in the Fifth Commandment two biblical but countercultural assumptions. Those being, number one, God designed gender, father and mother. And number two, God designed marriage, father and mother. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Point number one is that God designed gender. In Genesis 1.27, crucial verse if you want to know and, and be able to be equipped on this issue. This is what it says in Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. First of all, this verse teaches us the foundational truth that God created man. And he created man in his own image. And we could do a whole sermon on that topic of being made in the image of God. But all I want to highlight today is that God created man, and he created man with a certain design. A certain design that we didn't choose for ourselves. We didn't choose to be made in the image of God. God decided that. There's a certain givenness to our reality, is there not? Consider all that's been given to you about your identity, about who you are. You, for instance, didn't choose your birthday. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your skin color. You didn't choose your height. Our existence is given to us. Do you see that? It's not chosen by us. We have a fixed identity as created beings. 
And a part of that fixed identity, as we see in the text, is gender. It says in Genesis 1.27, male and female, he created them. The Bible teaches that gender is not something that we get to choose about ourselves. It's something that God created for us and assigns to us. He decided if you were male. He decided if you were female. From the earliest moments in your mother's womb, your DNA indicated whether you were a boy or a girl. Your gender, in other words, was assigned to you. Now this goes against our culture, obviously, which views sex as a biological reality, but gender as a social construct or a personal mindset. The biblical view, in contrast to our culture, doesn't separate your gender as something distinguishable from your sex. Biologically, you are a boy or girl. Now, of course, your gender um, can be... Can be articulated or expressed in different ways. It's not every man wants to hunt and not every girl wants to play baby dolls. That's not what, but, so there, there's a cultural element sometimes, but at its heart, your biology is your gender. And Jesus agrees with this, by the way. Jesus quotes this passage in Mark 10, 6 and says, but from the beginning of creation, he quotes, God made them male and female. These two genders are made by God to be equal yet distinct. According to Genesis 1.27, both male and female are made in the image of God, which means that men and women are equal in worth, in dignity, and value inside of God. The Bible does not teach that men are superior or better or more important than women. The Bible completely rejects any arrogance or abuse towards women in any way whatsoever. But the Bible also teaches that men and women are not the same. The Bible completely rejects the idea that men and women should be completely indistinguishable from one another. That you can just sub one in, sub one out, and it doesn't matter. In other words, it's not due to some sort of societal injustice that there aren't any men giving birth in our hospitals today. Okay? And it's not due to discrimination that there aren't any women playing in the National Football League today. Okay, men and women are equal in the sight of God, but they're also different. And these differences, brothers and sisters, don't find their source from evolution. And these differences don't find their source from an oppressive culture. These differences find their source in God, His wisdom, His design. This is the way that the world is because this is the way that God created the world to be. And in the Genesis account, on the sixth day of creation, Genesis 1.31, says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day. God created mankind in his image. He created them male and female, and God declared everything that he had made good. And as it says in our statement of faith, the Baptist faith, the message 2000, the gift of gender is thus part of the goodness of God's creation. Gender, as I said, is not the result of evolution or culture or sin, but gender is the result of God's good design. And therefore, we should embrace the design of God because that is where true flourishing will happen. What do I mean by that? Consider that if you decided this morning that you were able to fly, to truly believe that would, would lead to a lot of damage, would it not? But if you embrace your design to run and walk as opposed to flying, life will go better for you. Does that make sense? Or consider if you wanted to use a hammer as a spoon. Do you see how using something contrary to its design isn't going to cause you to flourish? That's not going to work well in this world. My friends, God has created you and has given you a gender and true flourishing will never come from trying to fight that. Instead, we need to learn to humbly accept the limitations that God has given us and allow Him to define who we truly are. So the first assumption I believe found within those three words of the fifth commandment, father and mother, is that God created two genders. There's a difference between fathers and mothers, male and female. Now the second assumption is what happens when those two genders get together. Point number two, God designed marriage. I want to read a rather 
a, a longer passage here, Genesis 2. You can flip there if you want, um, 18 through 25, but it should be on the screen. It says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whenever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord, called, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. As we mentioned in Genesis 1.31, at the very end of the sixth day, God declared that everything he created was good. Everything was good. If you read Genesis 1, it's just over and over again. Good, 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 good. And then finally, in verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2, we see that God declares something to be not good. And what was not good? That man should be alone. So in response to this not being good, God creates a woman who will be a helper fit for him. You see, that's what it says. He was going to make a woman who was a helper fit for him. Now, well, first of all, let me say that this, in other words, what God does in Genesis 2 is God literally designed the woman to be a counterpart to the man. Now, this word helper is not demeaning in any way whatsoever. And it kind of sounds like, okay, we got the help over here. Right? I, I get why we might think that. But did you know that the Lord refers to himself as a helper in Scripture? Psalm 54, 4. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. So God uses this phrase, helper, to refer to himself. It's not demeaning in any way whatsoever. But it in fact means that the woman has something that the man doesn't. This phrase, fit for him, literally means according to one in front of him. The man and the woman were designed to go together for companionship and partnership. It reminds me of the great romantic poet Rocky Balboa. When describing his relationship with Adrian, he said, She's got gaps. I've got gaps. Together, we fill gaps. Okay, that's exactly the biblical picture of marriage. God looked at man and saw his gaps and therefore created a woman to fill in his gaps and he fill in hers. Now here's one sentence of marriage counseling as an aside. Okay, this isn't the sermon. Here's one bit of marriage counseling for everyone. Maybe those frustrating differences between you and your spouse are on purpose and for your good. Okay. Notice how the narrative of Genesis 2 builds. Man needed a companion. It was not good that he was alone, but nothing in creation was fitting in the way that man needed. Nothing in creation could fill in his gaps. Animal after animal is brought before Adam in this naming process. And it's almost like Adam is searching or God is putting before him all these options and none of them work. Nobody could be what Adam needed. It says at the end of all these animals coming, it says, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Man needed something. Adam needed something that shared his nature but at the same time was different from him and was able to fill in his gaps. Does that make sense? Man needed something like him, but not like him. Similar, but not exactly the same. And nothing in creation fit that bill. So God creates the woman. And that leads to Adam breaking out in the beautiful song, At last, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She was from his body taken out of him, so similar, but at the same time she 
corresponded to him in a unique way so she was different and could fill in his gaps. And what were the man and woman supposed to do? Genesis 2, 24 through 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. In response to how man and woman complement one another, not compliment like you look pretty, but compliment like complimentary, like they, they work together well, God creates the institution of marriage. And here we see in Genesis 2 that marriage was God's idea. He came up with it, He designed it. And here's the idea of marriage. Two people, one man and one woman, becoming one flesh. I believe one flesh has a spiritual sense and a biological sense. Spiritually, those two people become so united in marriage that in a sense they are one person. Their two lives become interwoven in such a way that they, in a sense, become one life. It's not two lives anymore. It's one life. They're one flesh. You see that? But I also think it has a biological sense. That maybe this is so obvious you might miss it. But that one flesh language points to the fact that the male and the female were biologically designed to correspond to one another. They fit one another. If everybody picks up what I'm saying. And that biological correspondence is normally and typically productive and that product Activity from this biological correspondence leads to the husband and wife getting new titles, and that is father and mother. So through Genesis 1 and 2 and in the fifth commandment, we see that God's design for families is to be made up of a father and a mother. Again, we, we must reject the view that men and women are completely interchangeable. We also need to reject the view that a child really just needs their mother. Okay? God's design is for a father and a mother. So moms, this morning, I just want to tell you, you are an incredible blessing to your kid's life. Dads, I want to tell you, you are an incredible blessing to your kid's life. God designed the family so that you could pour into your kids. And we'll talk about that more next week. But don't buy the lie of your feelings that say otherwise sometimes that you are not important. Don't buy the lie of the culture that says you're really not needed. Now, of course, when we're talking about this, we we cannot escape the truth, the painful truth that we live in a broken world. People die. People leave. Marriages fall apart. Sin gets in the way. Please hear me this morning. God can still work in every single one of those situations. There is no situation that is too far gone for God. But let's not let the painful situation stop us from recognizing God's original design is a good design. And it's good for kids to have a father and a mother. And that's that's a good thing that we should embrace and support. So moms and dads in the room, fight for the flourishing of your kid by fighting for a biblical flourishing marriage. Okay. So far, we've seen the beautiful design of God assumed in those three words, the fifth commandment, father and mother. And I've tried to paint a biblical picture of what marriage is. Okay, so now, in light of the beautiful design, I want to take the opportunity, and I I believe I, I must take the opportunity, to talk about the most obvious desecration of God's beautiful design in our culture today. Um, so called homosexual marriage. Um, which according to what we've seen so far in God's word is not marriage at all. Now, the the biblical position on homosexuality is controversial. I get it, okay? But it's not controversial because of a lack of biblical clarity. Okay, so this is a controversial issue, but it's not a complex issue, in my mind, biblically. The Bible is extremely clear on this issue. There's not one single positive comment about homosexuality in the Bible in the Old Testament law, it clearly states. And here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to give you a biblical picture of homosexuality. Um, and, but I don't want to just tell you it. I want to try to equip you with the truth of God's word so that you can interact with arguments that you probably have seen and heard and dealt with. Okay? So, in the Old Testament law, it clearly states, Leviticus 18.22, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. 
Leviticus 20.13 says, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So if you quote these verses, you will be accused of picking and choosing verses from the Old Testament. You know, why are you talking about this verse and not talking about mixed fabric or, or anything like that? Or, you know, have, you know, shellfish or something like that. Now, this is a false accusation due to the three types of Old Testament law we covered last week. I'm going to briefly talk about them again um, this morning. There are ceremonial laws in the Old Testament. There are civil laws in the Old Testament. And there are moral laws in the Old Testament. Ceremonial laws are laws pertaining to Israel's worship. These have been fulfilled in Christ. Civil laws are laws that pertain to Israel's politics. And they do not directly apply to us in our modern context. Although we can learn from the principles behind those laws. Moral laws, on the other hand, are laws pertaining to God's righteous character and thus transcend, transcend all cultures. These laws, referring to homosexuality as an abomination, are obviously not ceremonial laws. They have nothing to do with Israel's worship. I do believe there's some civil law in here. Specifically when it talks about c committing people who commit homosexual acts being put to death, right? We do not live in ancient Israel. We, we, we are not a theocracy directly under God's rule like that anymore, like Israel was. So, so I think that's civil law that does not directly apply to us. However, in both of these verses, we clearly see God's moral law absolutely declare that homosexuality is a sin. And to further that argument, uh, you see this principle reaffirmed in the New Testament. And I want to do an overview of the main passages in the New Testament to equip you with this issue. First of all, I just want to get out of the way. Mark 7, 21 through 23 says, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The word that Jesus uses for sexual immorality in verse 21 is the word Porneia, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. You even hear it in the word, sexual immorality, porneia. And he calls porneia an evil thing. And Jesus, who upheld every letter of the Old Testament law, when he says sexual immorality, he means what the Old Testament meant when it said sexual immorality. He affirms the entire Old Testament sexual ethic with this word. So in this one word, porneia, Jesus stands with the Old Testament condemning homosexuality and calling it an evil thing. And I point this out at the very beginning because one of the main arguments you hear is that Jesus never said a single word about homosexuality. He did, right there in Mark 7, 21. Okay, when he called sexual immorality an evil thing. Okay, now turn your attention to 1 Timothy 1, 9-10 which says, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Um, there's a popular documentary that was recently released, I forget when, um, called 1946. Okay, And here's the main claim of that documentary. The documentary says that the word homosexual was not in the Bible until the year 1946. You might have um, seen this on Facebook or something like that, I don't know. Um, as far as I know, that is true. But also, a quick Google search will inform you that the word homosexual was first coined in 1868. So, no, so, so that word wasn't around when all these Bible translations were being made. So don't believe the meme, okay, that you often see on Facebook or something like that, that the Bible has been changed to be anti-gay. Like it really wasn't in there, but then these, these men got a hold of the Bible and they, and they threw that word in. No, if you look at the original word that Paul used in 1 Timothy 1.10, it's the word arsenikoites, okay? It's two words pushed together to become one word. The word male, arson, okay, and the word bed for coites. So it puts them together to, to say males who go to bed with males. He's very obviously talking about homosexuality as being a sin. And then, once our culture came up with this word homosexuality, 
it was used in our modern translations as a faithful translation of that word, arsenikoites. Now, I wish we had the time to look at the entirety of Romans 1, but I need to turn your attention to Romans 1, 26 through 27, where it says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. First of all, notice the binary in this passage. There are men and there are women. Then, notice there is such a thing in this passage as natural relations. This would be sex according to how God designed it. And isn't that just plain, matter of fact, straightforward point of view, refreshing? The Bible points out that there is a natural, normal, obvious way things are supposed to work. There's no confusion in Romans 1 like there is in our culture today, and I'm thankful for that. Therefore, since these acts are natural, there are also acts that are contrary to nature. This is to rebel against God's original design. This is to go against the natural, normal, obvious way things are supposed to work. And that's summed up in the text as women exchanging their natural relations with men for unnatural sexual relations with women and men giving up their natural relations with women to commit shameless acts with men. And this is shameless and offensive because it is an obvious rejection of God's created order. Often people will say something like, why, why should God care about what I do in the bedroom? As if it's silly for God to care about something so silly and demeaning or something like that. It's not silly. God designed us in a certain way that would lead to our flourishing. That would, there, there's an there's a intentional design and in, in telos or end of sex. So you, sex isn't just for our pleasure, but it was to, to procreate, to make, to make good babies, to, to, to fill the earth, to bless it and to fill it and subdue it. And, and to go against God's design completely circumvents that original purpose for the act. And therefore, this sin is spitting in the face of God's good gift. God's plan for marriage is father and mother. And it's rebellion against that plan to try to make marriage to be father and father or mother and mother. Not to mention that it doesn't work for its original intention. And what's the heart of this sin? Look at Romans 1, 24 through 25. that says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We learn here in Romans 1 that it's not just about sex. It's exchanging the truth about God for a lie. It's worshiping the creature instead of create, the creator. It's a rejection of God and his design. So, yes, it is a big deal. This is a big deal. And those the phrases in the text, God gave them up to, is what it says in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to. And it says at the end, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. As Joel Beakey said, I just want to quote this, homosexuality not only provokes the wrath of God, but is a sign that the wrath of God has already come upon an idolatrous people. Okay, last passage in regards to this. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it says, do not be deceived. You see that? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This phrase, men who practice homosexuality, is actually two words in Greek. Okay, there's arsenikoites, which we talked about earlier. And there's this other word, Malakos, if you're reading from the King James Version, it's in there where it says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, our modern translations just put um, men who practice homosexuality, but there's actually two different words there. And one means, you know, men in, in bed with men. And the other one means effeminate or soft. And so, in other words, in the text, Paul is describing um, both parties of the act. And there's an argument that you'll hear in the culture that says, well, Paul had no idea about loving, committed, 
faithful homosexual relationships. He was just talking about the common Roman practice of older men with younger boys. But here in 1 Corinthians, the reason why I point that uncomfortable truth out is that Paul describes both acts, both sides of the act as sinful. Paul is aware of mutual homosexual relationships. This was in the culture of the day. Paul isn't simply condemning a certain kind of oppressive homosexuality. He's condemning homosexuality in general. And Paul is clear in the text that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now stay with me here. Which means that men, women practicing homosexuality, the text says, will not go to heaven. Now let me be clear. This passage does not single out. It does not single out homosexuality. Paul says the same thing about people who are sexually immoral for any other reason. Like adultery, or pornography, or lust. So this morning, you could just easily say, those who watch pornography will not go to heaven. He also mentions idolaters, greedy people, thieves, drunkards. You could sum up his message by saying, no sinner will inherit the kingdom of God. The diff- and, and I point that out because it's not in my heart to try to pick on homosexuality. The Bible condemns all sin. The Bible condemns my sin. The Bible condemns your sin, whatever it may be. But the difference is, the reason why I have to do this in a sermon is because currently in our culture, there's not a whole month dedicated to drunk pride or thief pride. Okay? There's not a huge effort to pressure Christians to say that it's okay to be greedy idolaters. But there is obvious pressure in our culture to say that homosexuality is not sinful. There is pressure to reject the fifth commandment's good and natural assumption of those three words, father and mother. So please hear me. I, I know the pressure's there. I feel the pressure in the, right now as I, as I stand here before you. You feel the pressure as you go to work and, and talk to people and, and you're on social media and you're with your family. But please hear me this morning. Compromise on this issue is not loving. First of all, I know it can feel unloving because we can think these are just nice people who are just trying to be happy. And that's probably true. But pursuing sin is never going to lead to true happiness. It's never going to lead to true flourishing. It's never going to lead to true life. To quote Andrew Walker, it says, Scripture posits no reality where living contrary to God's Word in the long run prospers individuals. Second, the Bible says clearly, you just read it in God's Word, those who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. So to tell the LGBT plus community otherwise, to contradict God's word and say that they are okay when God's word says that they will never inherit the kingdom of God and they are headed for a hell apart from repentance and faith in Christ is the most hateful thing that we could ever do. To tell a murderer that they don't need to repent is not loving To tell an adulterer to keep on cheating on his wife will never lead to him having a good life. And to tell a homosexual that God approves of their lifestyle is a wicked, cowardly, hateful thing for us to do. So as a church, the most loving thing that we can do is lovingly stand on God's Word and clearly proclaim what it says, no sinner, including the sin of homosexuality, will inherit the kingdom of God. That's the loving thing to say, and that's the bad news. Here's the good news. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Sin, as we see so clearly in this passage, keeps us from being worthy of inheriting the kingdom of God. Because of sin, you can't go in. 
But Jesus Christ can save any sinner. Through Christ you can enter into the kingdom of God. No one is too sinful for Him to save. Jesus Christ can save any homosexual in the room. Jesus Christ can save any transgender person struggling with gender dysphoria. Jesus Christ can save anyone enslaved to pornography. Jesus Christ can save any sinner. And if you need proof, just look around the room. Every Christian is a testimony to that truth. That Jesus Christ can save sinners. And notice in that passage, Paul lists a bunch of sins and then says to the Corinthians in verse 11, and such were some of you. Which shows that Jesus Christ can save anyone and Jesus Christ can change anyone. Don't you love that word, were? Past tense. Showing us that Jesus truly can save you and Jesus, when he saves you, changes you. In other words, the thief does not get saved and then identify himself as a Christian thief. They were a thief. Now they're a Christian. So reject the notion of a quote-unquote gay Christian. Of course, there are Christians who struggle with homosexual desires. Like we all struggle with sin, we all struggle with sinful desires, but we don't accept our sin. We don't identify with our sin. We don't pursue our sin after we've been saved by Jesus Christ. We, know, we say, no, that, this is bad English, that were what we was. But we are not that any longer. We confess our sin to God. We we ask Him for help against our sin daily. We put our sin to death daily and we pursue a life that pleases God, trusting in Jesus Christ to change us. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality which would include homosexuality which would include pornography and all the rest that you abstain from sexual immorality that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you for God has not called us For impurity, but in holiness. In regards to all this, here's the last verse in this passage, verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. I try to be faithful to the Scriptures. If you disagree with the Scriptures, you can disagree with Matt Dixon, okay? But what the Scriptures say, you're not disagreeing with man, but with God. With all that said, a good summary of the biblical view of marriage is found in the Nashville Statement. It's a really good statement. Um, I'll I'll send it with my um, sermon notes tomorrow in an email. Um, In Article 1, it says, God has designed marriage to be a covenantal, sexual, procreative, lifelong union of one man and one woman. That's a good summary of the assumptions behind the fifth commandment, specifically those three words, father and mother. And this is a big deal. Because those three words, father and mother, so under attack in our culture today, reveal God's original design for gender, for marriage, and for the family. But not only that, but those three words, father and mother, reveal God's design for the gospel. As we read earlier in our service, Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Look at verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This passage reveals to us the truth that God did not design marriage simply for our flourishing, but God designed marriage to point us to the gospel. Oh, there's so much that could be said here. Let's keep it simple. As it said in the national statement, marriage is a lifelong union of one man and one woman. But in the gospel, there is an eternal union between Christ and his church. 
Isn't that amazing? That if you've placed your faith in Christ, that means that you are spiritually united to Christ. You are one with Christ. You have an intimate relationship with Christ. And God designed marriage to point us to those deeper spiritual realities seen in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's such a big deal to be faithful to marriage. It's because marriage is a picture of the gospel. So to mess with marriage is to mess with God's design to point us to the gospel. In conclusion, as a church, let's refuse to give up this ground to the culture. Let's promote and support and equip fathers and mothers. Let's stand on the word of God even when it's out of step with our culture. And if you're in here this morning, you're not a born-again Christian. Maybe this is your first time. Um, what a perfect, you know, time to come to church. You know, perfect, perfect first time to come. But if, if you are not a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, here's my appeal to you. If you sense in your heart that the culture is getting more and more untethered from reality on these issues, and you feel like people are losing what we might call common sense, I hope you realize that the only defense from this cultural, defi- cultural um, drift is biblical Christianity. That's the only real defense against what's happening in our culture. To have a rational reason to say, here's what gender is. Gender is not random, it comes from God. To say, marriage isn't just something we came up with, it, it comes from God. If there's a design here, there's a purpose here, there's an intention here. You can't say that with a secular worldview. You need the Bible. You need Christianity. So if you sense that in the culture and you see the, just how bankrupt it is without a biblical worldview, my invitation to you is come to Christ today. Put your faith in Jesus. Join a healthy local church that loves God's Word and stands on it. Build your life upon the wisdom of the Bible. And that will lead to flourishing because you'll be living the way that the Creator designed you to live. And that will lead you to being able to recognize the truth found in those three words, father and mother. I pray we'll always be able to recognize that as a church and a people. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your word. God, help us believe it and know it and love it and stand upon it. God, equip us with the truth so that we can go out in the world and stand upon a biblical worldview. God, I pray for anyone here who is um, far from you, God, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you can draw them to yourself and you can reveal to them how good you are and how needed you are and how um, just loving you are through Jesus Christ. And so, God, help us be a church um, that responds to your word and hears it and accepts it and believes it. Help us respond to your goodness now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand and respond?